grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, St. Paul sums up Jesus' entire ministry with these words. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, there's two primary groups that make up Jesus' audience. There were, of course, the Pharisees who saw themselves on the list of God's favorites. Along, of course, with the thieving tax collectors and the notorious prostitutes. Those who had chosen a life of dishonesty, carnal pleasure, and earthly gain. Both groups had gathered to hear Jesus teach. And to both groups, Jesus tells three stories, one right after the other. There's a story about a man who was looking for a lost sheep, and there's a story about a woman who was looking for a lost coin. And one of the stories that we did not read today, but you're very familiar with, there is a father who is looking for a lost son. All three parables concern lostness. With our attention this morning, really just on the first two. We hear them and we think first of a friend or a relative, perhaps someone who grew up going to church with perhaps children who had been raised in the faith but have since wandered off. And they've become lost. We usually think of ourselves or think to ourselves of singing amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I am found. It isn't wrong to think of these things, but there is a deeper drama that's unfolding underneath these parables, one that we miss if we think only in terms of individual conversion stories. Both the man and the woman in the parables have a singular object that they seek. The man is so transfixed on this one lost sheep and the woman on this one lost coin that nothing else matters to them. A deep internal passion drives both of these characters so much so that they will stop at nothing to accomplish the mission. No length of time, no ridicule from others, no personal danger to themselves, nothing will prevent them from finding what is lost. Does that sound familiar? These characters, they are pictures of our Lord. For Jesus was driven by a deep and internal passion, and he too will stop at nothing to complete his mission. And his mission, as we all know, is to go to the cross. For at the cross, he will find and he will save that which is lost. You know, one of the things that growing up in an evangelical home and church compared to being in a Lutheran church, we don't have crucifixes in the Baptist church. We don't wear crucifixes. Why do they say? Because it's way too what? Uh, it's too Catholic. Oh. So when I came into the Lutheran understanding of things, one of the things I started wearing pretty much on a regular basis is what? A crucifix. In Kansas, we would go to the college there. Uh, several pastors and myself, we would go there on their uh, days that they would sign up for all of their clubs and things. We were allowed to go there, and we set up a table, and we would give out catechisms, and we would all be standing there wearing our crucifixes, and time after time, somebody would say, my Jesus rose from the dead. Why do you have that Jesus on that cross? Say, because this was his mission. This is what saved humanity. This was his mission. 
Sure, you can't fit everything in one symbol of his of before he was incarnated, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection. There's no one symbol for all that, but this is his mission. And this is why we wear it. This is why we display it. Nothing would stop him from his mission. But what had been lost is not first and foremost a bunch of individuals, but rather a singular humanity. A humanity that is rooted concretely in Adam. It's genealogical source. You see, when Adam disobeyed God in the garden, he became the source of a lost humanity. A humanity lost its original communion with God and our fellowship with one another. But it is precisely Adam's being lost that provided the perfect setting for God to show his mercy, his wisdom, and his love in seeking him out. So just like the lost sheep and the lost coin, the only thing that Adam did to prompt God to search after him was getting lost. And driven by love, God did seek him out. For God so loved the world. If you recall this, immediately after Adam became lost in Genesis 3, we read that Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve, of course, hid themselves among the trees. The Lord called, where are you? Where are you, Adam? You always need to pay special attention when divine omnipotence asks a question. <laughs> where are you? It is as if he said, my child, what have you done? I gave you everything. I created you to live with me. I gave you all that I am, all that I have. I created you to bear my image on earth. I breathed into your very nostrils the breath of my own life. But you rejected it. You ruined it. Where? are you. You know, when the Lord God walked through the garden that day calling out for Adam, he took the very first steps of a journey that would lead him all the way to the cross. For it is in the cross that the question, where are you, Adam, it finds its answer. Our Lord even says in Ezekiel, Behold, I I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. So again, it's in the cross that Jesus, who came to seek and to save that which had been lost, found and saved a lost humanity. A man couldn't go after the lost sheep without, of course, putting himself in danger. To find the lost sheep, the man had to enter into the perilous world of the sheep, following the same treacherous path on which the sheep first got lost, as well as enduring the gaze of all of the predators who wanted to get to the sheep before the man did. The man will not return to the flock without his own bruises and without his own scars and he will not return the sheep to the fold without placing that sheep on his shoulders and carrying it back over difficult terrain. In seeking Adam who was lost in death, Jesus sought all people and each one of you. For in Adam all die. But in Christ, all are made alive. And within this larger story of redemption, within this overarching arc of salvation, then and only then 
to each one of our individual stories, find then its meaning and its setting. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying to you that what Jesus is talking about is this, we would say, the meta-narrative, the big picture rather than just focusing on our individual conversion stories. I heard a, a conversion story just yesterday. I couldn't believe where I heard it from and who it was coming from. Do I tell you the details about that? Oh, sure, why not? Russell Brand, have you heard of this guy before? I don't know much about him at all. I know he's got a funny accent, he talks a lot, kind of funny guy, never really paid attention to him. And I saw something about him getting baptized. And you know what my first thought was? You think it was praise the Lord? No, it was like, there's another evangelical getting baptized again so that he can have some kind of experience. I know, I'm kind of critical that, that way. But I heard him in an interview yesterday. And he was talking about his conversion story. And folks, I had to tell you, several times I was brought to tears. It was so sincere. And the topic really wasn't even about his conversion, but he got it in there. And he's quoting scripture. He's like, man, my life was a mess. Typical conversion story. My life was a mess. And Jesus saved me. It was beautiful. Just beautiful. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that the parables are talking about this. And if we understand this, then we can really see the beauty in these individual stories rather than throwing this off and just looking at the individual stories. Are you with me, gang? Somebody say amen or I'm going to do it all over again. <laughs> so then in conclusion, what does the man do when he returns home? Jesus says he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Likewise, the woman, when she finds her coin, which most likely, why was it so important, we would just say, oh, it's just a lost coin, it's no big deal. Most likely, it was in a headdress that went in her hair that was a part of her dowry. This is why it's so special. She calls together her friends and her neighbors and she says, Rejoice with me. I found the coin that I lost. This was an heirloom. Maybe her mother, her grandmother gave it to her. See, when one is overcome with joy, boy, it's, it's difficult to keep it contained. It's the joy we experienced this week when we all heard that the stroke that Neil had was... It's gone. Yeah, he's got some side effects still, but it's beautiful. Praise be to God. That joy could not be contained. I was telling people who don't know Neil, don't know you, never been to Hickory. Like, you've got to hear this. Pure joy cannot help but overflow into this communal celebration. And this joy, beloved, this feast, it's already started. It is the wedding feast of the Lamb of which you get a little foretaste now with the bread of immortality and the wine of everlasting joy that has been set before you today. By the way, you should get a load of who's going to be at the wedding feast. It is a scandalous mess of folk. For every single one at that celebration were once dead in their sins and their trespasses. They were once lost in the dominion of darkness, yet they were found by Christ. They were washed in the waters of holy baptism with all of their sins bled and died for in the mercy of Christ, where he then clothed them in his righteousness. And beloved, I just want to remind you, though I and the attendants they wear a white robe. This always is supposed to symbolize that you do too. You do too. Clothe not in the fig leaves of sin and shame, but you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ because He found you. To which we say,
Praise be to God. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.